Hey guys, Chad Hoover, Kayak Bass and TV, and welcome back to part two of my two-part series, because there's two parts to part two. Anyway, welcome back to part two of my two-part series on my top five favorite lures for fishing the late summer to early fall transition. All right guys, so in part one, I talked about my two favorite lures for fish in the fall because it's my favorite way to fish and that's top water and the hollow body frog and the whopper plopper. Now, if you didn't see that video, click on this little thing up here hovering over my head, go back and watch that video and it'll really round out uh, what we're talking about here for the late summer into early fall transition. So I talked about the whopper plopper and the hollow body frog because they're my favorite way to catch fish, but not necessarily because they're the way to catch the most fish or even the biggest fish this time of year. Because these fish are feeding up, right? They're moving into shallow water. They're starting to follow threadfin shad and they're starting to work their way into the back of creeks. They're not always looking for a giant meal like a 190 size whopper plopper. Some guys like me like to force feed them because that's the way we want to catch them. But if you want to catch numbers and you still want to have the opportunity to catch a giant fish and you're out there to have a good time or show a new angler how to catch big fish or if you're fishing for five fish because you're fishing a tournament, these are my top three lures for producing results, for producing numbers and still quality fish because a lot of times in the fall, if you find a good size school of fish, you can catch five good fish in a hurry if you're chasing that 20 inch mark, which is about a five pound fish in most places in the Southeast and it's gonna put you in their money, whether you're fishing a boat tournament, a kayak tournament, or just fishing for fun. And those three lures are a fluke, which is one of the most kind of overlooked now and underrated lures on the market, a chatterbait, and a couple of different sizes and configurations, and then something that is, for whatever reason, lost popularity, that isn't something that I hear talked about a lot, but the old popper, just a standard hard body popper. So those are my three favorite ones, and let's go through and just jump right into talking about them. All right, I like two different styles of flukes, and I like basically three or four different colors in each one, but primarily I keep it simple, okay? At any time I'm fishing the fall, I'm gonna have two basic colors with me. I'm gonna have an albino shad and I'm gonna have a baby bass color in zoom. And then I keep it even simpler when I fish the Yamamoto. I keep it in the straight up D shad, all right? And what I like about the D shad over the zoom is, well, it just depends on, on how I'm fishing and where I'm fishing. So let me just pull out one of each and show you kind of my difference, my different approach to fishing flukes. When it's the beginning of the feeding time, when the fish are slow and they're a little more lethargic and I want to keep it in their face, I'm going to fish the Zoom Super Fluke and generally the standard size, all right? I like it in uh, the albino shad color when the sun's out, when the water's clear, when I got high pressure, and then I like it in the baby bass color for a little more contrast, pretty much when there's any kind of stain to the water, if it's overcast or the sun is low in the sky. I like to fish this just like I fish a Senko. I fish it on a um, Mustad big mouth tube hook in either a three, four, or five aught. Now, the reason that I change the sizes is how much erratic action I want. When I want uh, a super erratic action, I'll go to a five aught. When I want less erratic action, I'll drop down to a four. And then when I want to fish it super subtle, I'll drop down to a three aught hook and keep that hook towards the front. What I really like about the Mustad big mouth tube hook is it doesn't tear up the fluke as easy. It sits in there nice and easy, but it's a heavy gauge hook that is gonna really allow that bait to fall and it's gonna add a little bit of weight to it. So I will fish this on a loop knot and leave the hook tip protruding if I want it to walk the dog just below the surface with the zoom. I will also do the same thing when I'm fishing the Yamamoto, but there's two distinct reasons why I pick one over the other and vice versa. When I first start working my way back into the creeks, and before the fish get super aggressive or until I start seeing surface activity, I'm gonna be fishing the Zoom Super Fluke. And the reason being is it's a little lighter, it's a little more buoyant, and I can throw it out there and I can just hop, twitch, twitch. And I can just kind of work it through the water column, almost like I'm walking the dog under the surface. And then I can kill it and just let it slow fall next to wood, next to little grass pockets, next to rocks and things like that. And it just stays in the strike zone a little bit longer. If I'm fishing current or when I'm wanting to fish a little faster, I opt for the, the D shad uh, in the fluke from Yamamoto because it's a heavier, uh, denser, uh, more, it's got more silica sand in it and it's a little bit more compact um, from Yamamoto, a lot like you come to expect from a Senko. So when I'm covering water, when I'm fishing faster, when there's a little bit of current or when the fish get really aggressive, I like this bait because it has a little bit more of a salt flavor to it like all Yamamoto baits are, are, are known for 
but it's heavier. It's gonna cast a little further. It's gonna allow me to cover a little bit more water. It's gonna fall faster, but also if I wanna work it faster, it still stays below the surface. I get that good walk the dog or erratic jerk bait action that a fluke is known for, but it doesn't hop up on the top and I can cover more water more quickly. So those are my two favorite flukes. One of the things that I like to do when I've got wads of these really small shad that are working up a creek is sometimes drop down to the little bit smaller size on a smaller hook, even nose hooking this and throwing it on a drop shot rig uh, in the Fluke Junior. So between the Yamamoto and the, and the Super Fluke, they take up about 95% of my fluke fishing, which is my exploratory lure when fish start to work their way up creeks. But when they're hard to get to bite, when there's so much bait in the water, I can't get them. One of the things I like to do is put this bait in some, some dye, uh, some JJ's Magic, some Spike It or something like that to give it a little bit of a chartreuse tinge, which you can kind of see here, just so it sticks out a bit. Uh, this is the albino shad color. This is albino shad and the Fluke Junior's got a little bit more glitter to it, a little more flash and it'll stick out in that water shad. And when I fish it on a drop shot, I can throw it out and I could hop it along. It's more of a flip shot than anything else. I'm hopping it along, but it's staying in place. So when that school scatters and that, ba that bass takes off of them, it's sitting there. It's, it's let, it's basically stays in the strike zone and it's the, uh, you know, the one that got left behind and it's an easy meal for the bass. So if I really have really tiny, small shad, and I'm just not getting bites on the bigger bakes. I'll downsize to that Fluke Junior, fish it on a drop shot rig. But one of the things that I also like to do on this lure uh, that I don't know a lot of people do, um, and, and I just started doing it a couple years ago, is I fish it on a shaky head style um, jig head, okay? And I'm just gonna rig this up and show you why I do that. Because when I do this this way, I can cast it into the schools, I can skip it, I can cover a lot more water but I can also get a vertical presentation, a yo-yo presentation out of it, which allows me to scatter the school, which will get the bass's attention. And then a lot of times uh, my lure is left there, the thing to be eaten. So you simply screw that nose on there and then either run your hook through it like you're doing with a traditional um, shaky head. But what I do a lot of times to give this thing an erratic action, to make it spiral, to make it dart, is I actually take the hook and I just pull it into the side and skin it, which makes that bait have a crook in it, which makes it spin, fish more erratic. And when you throw this thing out there, it hits the bottom, you can hop and pop it. It gets the bass's attention. You can still reel it on the surface. You can still fish it mid water column, but don't overlook taking a fluke. And you can even do this with the bigger flukes, but I really like doing it with a fluke junior. Skipping that thing into a school, scatter them, the bass takes off, your lure's left. But a super fluke junior, or a fluke junior, on a shaky head style jig head is deadly effective when you start working your way back up into creeks and following those shad as they move up into the shallow water and moving their way to the back of creeks. Um, all right, so flukes for me are pretty much a no brainer, but now let's talk about one of my favorite lures that really came into my arsenal, you know, four or five years ago as something that I fish more than a novelty. And that is a chatterbait. When I first started fishing chatterbaits, I really only fished them in a couple of sizes. I fished them in a half ounce and a three quarter ounce, and I fished them in either uh, black green pumpkin or white chartreuse. That was it. I've gotten to where I'm a little bit more discriminating with my, with my uh, chatterbaits now. I've gotten to where I like to do a lot more things with them, and I've gotten to where I really like to be a little bit more creative. The reason that I like a chatterbait is when I'm throwing into those shad schools, I can scatter the shad. I can make the other bass in the area feel like a bass just come through there and crush them because it's got that vibration, it's got that thump, okay? I also like the fact that I can vary the size, I can vary the trailers, I can vary the way that I rig them. And so one of my more popular, one of my favorite ways to fish this thing uh, is with a swim bait style body. Uh, a lot of times it's after it's been torn up and I rig it on there, put a little dab of glue or just force it up on there and, and pinch it on the hook keeper. Uh, in a natural shad color with a little bit heavier head, what that does is that allows me to fish it in the middle of the water column because this bait gives it some more lift, cast it further because it's got a heavier head. But if I want to fish drop-offs, if I want to fish ledges, if I want to fish creek channels and those migratory areas where the fish are working their way in, if I happen to go up the creek and I haven't found the fish in there yet, this is a great search bait. It's a great exploratory bait. And it's one of those lures that you can use to find the fish. Once I find the fish with a chatterbait, a lot of times I will switch to something else. I'll switch to a soft body swim bait. I'll switch to a fluke. I'll get more pinpoint with my presentation. But when I'm covering water and I'm trying to find the fish, uh, a lot like the, I talked about in the Whopper Plopper, 
this lure will pull me down a creek channel. It'll move me along really slowly. Um, I can throw it down deep and I can hop and pop it and fish it like a jig. And then I can fish it a bit like a swim bait or a swim jig and just use it as a very versatile search bait, top to bottom, you know, fan cast it and really cover water with it. So if you are kind of on the fence about getting out and fishing in the fall, you want to have some success, this is probably one of the lures you should actually start with. You can buy it in a couple sizes and a couple colors and get out there experiment. A lot like the rule with the Whopper Plopper, if I am fishing stained water, uh, I'm going to go with a little bit darker profile and I'm going to go with a darker um, hollow body tail. Uh, something in like an Arkansas Shiner or a um, and even a, a green pumpkin or something along those lines. What I really like though, is I like to add this bait right here. This is, I almost kind of said to myself, I was never gonna like put this on the channel because it's like deadly effective. It's one of my favorite ways to fish a chatterbait. I like to take the Hartail swim bait from Yamamoto. After I've torn them up, I save them. As you can see, this one here has been torn up a bit. I'll cut them off with my pocket knife. So I just take the pocket knife. I call this the rebate concept. And I'm just gonna cut that head off right here, right behind where the cavity starts. See how I did that? I'm gonna take that and I'm just gonna work it onto, leaving the cavity on the downside. I'm gonna go right into that body. The way that you can measure is just a pinch where you want it to come out, bring it in, bring that hook point out, work that bait up on top of it, pinch it into the plastic so it holds it in place. And that right there is a deadly, deadly, deadly year round bait. But in the fall, because of the kick and the thump of that hardtail, because it creates a little bubble trail behind it when I'm fishing it as the sun goes down and I fish in tonight, there's thump, there's wobble, there's rock and roll that gives it uh, a contrasting look. So it changes the look of the bait to the fish. You get the white, green, white, green, white, green. This right here is one of my most effective patterns for fishing the fall transition, for fishing the spring transition, and it's one of my favorite search baits out there. I like it in a three quarter ounce. I like it with the hardtail worm cut off just, or the hardtail swim bait cut off just in front of the cavity. I like it rigged on there, natural shad with the green back, tie it on, throw it and reel it, and hang on because you'll get your arm broke with this in the fall. What's great about this bait also, and the reason that I use the hardtail over a lot of the other swim bait trailers out there is because it's salt impregnated. So if I have a fish miss it, I can kill it. It falls to the bottom, they'll swim up, they nose it, they'll pick it up and you can set the hook on them because you can fish this thing a lot like a jig. And then as the water temperature gets colder, you can stick with this longer than almost any lure out there with the exception of maybe a, a square bill crankbait or a deep diving crankbait. But you can stick with this lure from the beginning of the transition to the end of the transition and catch a lot of fish. So. The takeaway from all of these videos is if you want one place to start, if you say, man, I don't have the time nor the money to get out there and fish, I would recommend starting with a Project Z chatterbait in three quarter ounce with a hardtail worm trailer or hardtail swim bait trailer from Yamamoto. And I promise you, you'll, uh, you better hang on when you start tying that thing on and throwing it. Now, we've got two of my last three of my top five favorite fall baits. And now I'm going to transition to the last one. And I'm not gonna say that I saved the best for last, but I'm gonna save what I call one of my favorites for last. Partially because this is fun to film, partially because it's fun to social fish. If you're fishing with somebody else and you're throwing a popper out there, a lot of times when you're watching somebody else from your peripheral vision, you can't see what they're throwing. But when you're throwing a popper and it does that bloop, bloop, and it creates a disturbance, when that bass hits it, there's no doubt about it. So it's great for filming. It's great for those transition periods when it's off peak and the fish have gotten less aggressive and they're staging on wood, they're staging in grass. It stays in the strike zone a long time. It creates a huge disturbance, but a lot of time what it does is it fires the school up. Okay, you can do that with a whopper plopper, but a lot of times that whopper plopper is moving so fast it may have fired the school up and then they're like, oh, and it's out of the strike zone. I really like the popper because it activates the school. It activates that feeding instinct. It creates that bloop, bloop on the surface, which to a bass is another bass eating. They look up, there's the bait that seemingly got away from the other bass that blew up and missed it, and it's an easy meal. It stays in the strike zone a long time. I have fished this strike zone one so much that all the dang paint's knocked off the bottom of it. I really like it with a feather in the fall. I do. I don't like it with a feather as much in the springtime. Uh, I don't know why. I just do really well with the feather in the fall. I think a lot of it's got to do with brim. Brim are coming up and picking at that feather. And because that brim is picking at that feather, that bass sees that bait sitting still. 
I get jacked up when I throw a popper out and pop it two times and then I see it just getting kind of just kind of getting pecked and I know that brim is sitting there pecking at it that bass is going to swim in it's going to spook that brim it's going to take off and then there my bait sits waiting to get ate I like to fish this on a spinning rod if I'm fishing it slow and a casting rod if I'm fishing it fast. I like to hold my rod horizontal and I pop and pull and then give back. And the reason that I like to give back is I, I do a pop and then I pull. And that makes it boop and kind of create a bubble trail as it seeks the surface. But when I give back, what happens is, is that bait is moving and when it runs into the turbulence that it created and you give that slack, it makes the bait turn just a bit, okay? That little turn. So again, pop and pull and you know, drag it and then give back at the last minute. That puts a little bit of slack in the line. This bait has created a turbulence and a pressure wave in front of it, okay? It runs into that pressure wave when you give it slack and it'll turn sideways as it comes to the surface. And that bass then sees a bigger profile of that bait. You got two treble hooks hanging there. You got that feather and they just annihilate it. Sometimes you're gonna get them all the way down in the gullet. They're gonna hit it so hard. So guys, listen, this is my two part video series on the top five baits you should fish in fall. They're my go-tos when I start zeroing in on the bait, when I start following these fish into the back of creeks, when I'm looking for them in staging and transition areas before they start to move into the creeks, and they're the lures that I catch the most fish on. Now, I do have some honorable mentions, and I do have some things that you should add to your arsenal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna end this video Give it a big thumbs up if you like it. Leave a comment below about part one and part two. I'm gonna put the video right here on the side for you guys to click on to go back and watch part one if you didn't. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be back with the third part of this series, but it's not my top five. It's my honorable mentions and things you should definitely have in your arsenal for fall. So again, do me a favor, give this video a big thumbs up. Leave a comment below, smash that subscribe button if you haven't yet, and be sure to come in, come back for the next video where I talk about my honorable mentions and some of the ones that might put the biggest fish you've ever caught in the boat in the fall.